This is the 2024 Game Badge, and today we're going to walk through the entire build from start to finish. Stick around and I'll show you how to build this small, Pico-based handheld game system. This is Episode 2 of my Game Badge 2024 series. In the last episode of this series, I gave you a high-level overview of the game badge design and walked you through some of the changes in this year's version. But today, we're going to dive into the end-to-end -end build process. Now, if you want to follow along with this build, I've included links to the Gerber files for the PCB, as well as the parts list in this video's description. If you're attending the game badge workshops, you're going to get a board like this one. The boards we use in the workshop has some of the smaller surface mount components pre-soldered by PCBWay. And for the workshops, this helps us out in a couple of different ways. First, dividing up and distributing a bunch of tiny resistors and capacitors to a room full of people is very tedious, and it's easy to get these tiny little components mixed up and not realize that you've given someone the wrong part until after the build's done and it doesn't work. But also, soldering these components takes a lot of time, especially for folks that don't do it every day. So getting these small parts pre-assembled helps make sure that everyone gets out of the workshop on time and with a working game badge. But if you're not in the workshop, you're going to be starting from a completely empty board like this one. Now, when you work on a board like this, you generally want to start with the lowest profile components first and work your way up to the taller ones. So we'll start off with the smallest surface mount components first, the resistors and capacitors. Let's go ahead and jump into this build. First, you'll need four 2 kilo ohm resistors. Three of them are mounted on the front of the board in the spots labeled R1, R2, and R3, and the other resistor is mounted on the back of the board in spot R7 near the bottom. Working with surface mount components can be a little tricky if you haven't done it before. So here's the technique that you'll want to use. Start out by placing a little bit of solder on only one of the pads. Then while holding the soldering iron in your dominant hand, heat the pad up while bringing the component into the melted solder using tweezers in your other hand. Then move the soldering iron away from the part while holding the tweezers still until the solder cools down. Then the part will stay in place while you deposit a little bit of solder onto the other pad. Next, we have three 20 kilo ohm resistors. Now these are mounted on the back in spots R4, R5, and R6. And then for 33 kilo ohm resistors, and these go in spots R8, R9, R10, and R11. These are used to set the volume on four of the audio wave generator channels. There's also nine one microfarad capacitors. Now all the caps for this board are the same, so these go in the spots labeled C1 through C9. C1 is a decoupling capacitor. C2 is used for the voltage regulator. <laughs> 
and C5 are for the audio amplifier. And these remaining five caps are for our five audio lines. Next, we have the charge controller chip. We're using a lithium polymer battery on the game badge, so this chip will manage the power to the battery. Now it's easy to bridge pins on this chip, so if you do, first just try cleaning the tip of your iron and wiping away the excess solder. If that doesn't work, you can add a little flux. And if the solder bridge is especially stubborn, you can break out the desoldering wick and suck it up. After that, we can place on the voltage regulator. Now this goes right above the charge controller near the top of the board. This chip is responsible for making sure that a steady 3.3 volts is supplied to the board. Next, we'll solder on the audio amplifier. Now make sure the dot on the chip is near the line and circle on the board. This indicates pin one, so you're ensured to install the chip in the correct orientation. Attach just one leg first, and then take your time lining up the other legs with the pads on the board. Once you have them lined up, you can go ahead and solder the other legs. Now it's time for the Pico. Now I recommend using the non-Wi-Fi version for this build. Since there are some vias here, I'm going to put down a piece of Kapton tape just to give it a little bit of insulation. And I'll start off with soldering one pad first so I can get the Pico lined up before soldering the other pads. You'll want to make sure that the solder works its way onto both the Pico and the PCB under it. So don't be afraid to flood these pads with plenty of solder. Okay, now we can start mounting some of the larger components. We'll do the power switch next. The switch sits on the front side of the board and gets soldered on the back. All right, now we'll add our buttons. There's 10 in total. Nine of them go on the front of the board for the D-pad, the A, B, and C buttons, and for start and select. Personally, I like the more sensitive buttons that only take 100 grams of force to activate. So those are the ones that I'm using here. The last button is the reset button, which is on the back of the board. For that, I'm using a stiffer button with 160 grams of force, so it's a little bit more difficult to accidentally press it. Next, we have two LEDs, one for power and the other to indicate charging status. Now you can choose any colors you'd like for these LEDs. You do wanna make sure you get the orientation correct. The longer leg of the LED is the anode, so that leg gets inserted into the hole that's marked with the plus sign. Next, we'll tackle the LCD. First, you'll need to solder an 8-pin header to the screen. The short side of the header gets inserted into the back of the LCD assembly 
and you'll place the solder on the front side of the LCD next to the screen. Now it's a good idea to keep the protective film on the screen while you're doing this, just to protect it from any potential splatter. Once you have the pin header in place, you can go ahead and screw the LCD onto the board to get it all lined up. And then solder the other side of the pin headers into the game badge PCB. Now for the new part, the micro SD card slot. First, solder the header pins into the card slot's PCB. This PCB then gets inserted into the backside of the game badge, so the card slot should be sitting just above the Pico. Now, it's a close fit, but there's nothing on the underside to short out, so you're fine putting it right up against the Pico. Then flip the board over and solder the pins in place. Next, we'll solder on the battery. This is just a 380 milliamp LiPo that you'd normally use with one of those small toy quadcopters. You'll need to snip the wires from the connector using some flush cutters. Now I like to do one wire at a time just to make sure that I don't accidentally short them out. Finally, we can connect the speaker. This is a 16 millimeter one watt speaker that I picked up from Amazon. We'll solder the speaker onto these two spots near the bottom of the PCB. Okay, all the soldering's done. Now we need to put it in a case. If you go to the Game Badge Wiki, you'll see two versions of the case. The one that's in the folder called Casing 2024 Rev 3B is Ben's version with the hinged door. But there's also a folder called Casing 2024 Rev 3B Alternate, and this is the case that I designed, which is more form-fitting and makes the micro SD card accessible without the door. And you'll also need to print off the D-pad and a set of the buttons. Assembly is pretty straightforward. First, mount the speaker into the front half of the case by peeling back the sticker paper and lining it up over the hole. You may also want to put down just a little bit of hot glue to keep it in place. Next, set the buttons into the front half of the case and just briefly touch it with your iron to melt the pegs so it keeps the button assembly in place. Then you can place in the Game Badge PCB and attach the rear shell with three 10 millimeter M2 screws. And that's it. Your 2024 Game Badge is ready to go. Now to test it out, I wrote a test program which you'll find in the GitHub repo under the code folder. All you have to do is download the UF2 file, make sure the Game Badge is turned off, and plug it into your computer over USB. With it plugged in, hold down the white boot select button while turning it on. The game badge will show up as a USB flash drive. All you need to do is drag and drop that UF2 file over to that drive. The game badge will reboot and should run the test program where you can verify that the display is working as well as the buttons and the audio. All right, at this point, you should hopefully have a working game badge in your possession. In the next video, we'll take a look at the software side and I'll show you how to run some games and emulators. All right, I'll see you in the next one, but until then, Go make something cool.